Hey y'all, Coach in the Fight here, talking about the Great Awakening and what humanity can expect in the Great Awakening. Now, what we plan to do is step down through some key verses in the Bible and some of the apocryphal books, as well as the Third Testament of the Bible, and see what scripture has to say about this event that we are expecting that we call the Great Awakening and or the Rapture. Now, this awakening that we are talking about is best described in Daniel in chapter 12, where it says, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. Now, this Michael figure is the same angel that you read about over in Exodus chapter 23, verses 20 through 23. And also in Malachi and chapter 3 where he is referred to as the covenant angel to understand who this Michael is you have to jump over to a book called the Shepherd of Hermas in similitudes 8 and verse 25 there you will learn that it is the archangel Michael who is in charge of the law it says the great and venerable angel which you saw was Michael who has the power over his people and governs them for he planted the law in the hearts of those who have believed and therefore he visits them to whom he has given the law to see if they will keep it and again you see that he is possessive here as he's saying power over his people in Daniel in chapter 12 it says the children of thy people and these are the same people the people that keep the law going on in verse 1 it says and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time what this is describing is Jacob's trouble and this is one of the things that we can expect to happen during this time so one of the things that we can expect to happen during this time is this war on those who keep the commandments that we read about over in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17 but no worries because chapter 12 verse 1 goes on to say and at that time thy people shall be delivered everyone that shall be written in the book so as long as your name is written in the book of life you will be delivered matter of fact if you come back over to the shepherd of Hermas in his first book called visions and go to chapter 4 our father gives us a representation of the tribulation you see right there in verse 8 that as, as Hermes was walking along he saw a huge dust cloud that he thought looked kind of supernatural and out of that dust a huge beast which looked like a well and had fiery locusts coming out of his mouth that beast that he saw was a representation of the tribulation but notice there in verse 9 how he says and I began to weep and pray unto the Lord that he would deliver me from it then I called to mind the word which I had heard doubt not Hermes whereunto brethren put it on a divine faith and remembering it who it was that had taught me great things I delivered myself bodily unto the beast so Hermes in an act of courage faced the beast head on putting full faith in our father but you see right there in verse 12 it says and I came near unto it and the beast extended its whole bulk up on the ground and put forth nothing but its tongue nor once moved itself till I had quite passed by it so the tribulation turned out to be nothing to Hermes because he put faith in the Lord and his word so that is how we are to conquer the tribulation as well but anyway let's come over to the third testament of the bible because i want to pull out a few key verses that describe how this great awakening event will happen and what we can expect during this time of change it's a little bit out of order and almost random but I'm just going to step down through the verses that I have highlighted here in my notes from the third testament of the Bible please look for a link to this book in the description of this video because I plan to just hit the highlights okay one of the first verses that I want to show you guys is coming over here in chapter 55 this is extremely important to this conversation so I want to touch on it first 
verse 20 says, I have always given you time to prepare and appointed the means for your salvation before sending you my justice to receive an accounting for you at the end of the era of phase. I have shown you my love and exalted you to repentance, reform, and the good. Okay, now this is important. What he's talking about is how we have had the word of God all of this time, given us the opportunity to learn what the scripture is actually talking about. So that's why he's saying he has always given us time to prepare before these major events are to take place. So basically, there are no excuses. But watch this verse down here, verse 21. It says, nonetheless, at the hour of justice, I have never presented myself to ask if you have repented or if you have prepared yourself or whether you remain still submerged in disobedience or evil. Now, you really need to understand that because some of you have not been preparing yourselves for this event. But if you notice what he says there is that he hasn't been holding us accountable before the hour of justice. That's why you see so many people breaking the rules and breaking the laws and nobody's getting in trouble for it. We are in the time of preparation, like in boot camp, where we're learning what we're supposed to do. But that's going to change at the Great Awakening and then we'll start to be held accountable for our obedience to the scripture. So the message and all of that, I believe, is don't worry about what you've done in the past and even what you're doing now. But when we start to recognize the signs of this hour of justice, then is the time that we better start to learn to get right. You see, in 22, it says, my justice has arrived at the appointed time and he who has known to build his ark on time has been saved. While he who responded with ridicule and did nothing for his salvation when the hour of justice was announced had to perish. So this is important to understand is the announcement of the hour of justice. What will you do at that time? Not what you're doing now, not what you've done in the past. What are you going to do when the hour of justice is announced? Are you going to respond with ridicule like the hypocrites and the false prophets? Are you going to do nothing for your salvation like the unbelievers? If so, you will perish. All right, let's go on to the next verse. In chapter 53 and verse 44. It says, among the humble and ignored, there shall arise men and women whose words full of light shall surprise the theologians, philosophers and scientists. And when the struggle is at its height and the poor are humiliated and their testimonies denied by the arrogant, that shall be the moment when Elijah calls the wise, the lords and the princes and puts them to the test. Now, this Elijah figure is also known as the covenant angel. Therefore, Elijah is just another name for Michael. You can get a full understanding of that when you jump over and look at Malachi in chapter 4. In chapter 3, he was described as the messenger of the covenant. But in chapter 4, he's given a name and that name he's given is Elijah the prophet. And in this verse, we see where it's talking about the struggle at its height. And the poor humiliated and their testimonies denied by the arrogant. This is what Daniel was talking about when he was talking about a time of trouble. But during that time of trouble, we can expect Elijah to call the wise. This would be the same wise individuals that we see over in Daniel in chapter 12 and verse 10. See how it's saying that many shall be purified and made white and tried. But the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Now, this is a very interesting verse here, because sure, the world is expecting this great awakening, but it's not going to affect everybody the same way. The wise are those who keep the law, and they're going to understand what's going on when this Elijah slash Michael figure stands up. But those who do wickedly will not understand. And this will be what causes 
that war on those who keep the commandments. But anyway, we'll come back to this verse. But you see back over here in the third testament of the Bible, it says that once Elijah calls the wise, the lords and the princes, they will be put to the test. It says, woe to the false and hypocrites in that hour for perfect justice shall descend to them. So it's talking about the false prophets and the hypocrites will receive perfect justice. You can see why and how this justice will play out over the, in the book of Jeremiah in chapter 14. You see right there in verse 13, it says, Then said I, O Lord, behold, the prophets say unto them, Ye shall not see the sword, neither shall have famine, but I will give you a short peace in this place. These prophets are prophesying to us that we don't have to worry about anything during the tribulation. They tell us that God is going to supernaturally remove us from the planet before any of the bad stuff happens. That's what it talks about when it says, shall not see the sword, neither shall you have famine, but I will give you assured peace in this place. That's the teachings of the false and the hypocrites. Verse 14, it says, these prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spake unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision and divination, a thing of naught and the deceit of their heart. They're prophesying that strong delusion that we hear about over in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and 11 and in Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 4. The entire world is going to go through this judgment and nobody's going to escape. But anyway, you jump back over to Jeremiah in chapter 14. Verse 15 says that those false prophets will be the exact ones that receive the sword and the famine. It says by sword and famine shall those prophets be consumed. But watch out now because verse 16 is saying those who listen to those false prophets and those hypocrites will be cast out into the streets because of the famine and the sword. We're coming back over here to the third testament verse 46 says it shall be the hour of justice but from it many spirits will ascend unto true life many hearts will arise and many eyes will be opened to the light this is the great awakening right here that will be going on during that time sure it is a time of trouble for the wicked and the false and the hypocrites but for the wise their spirits will ascend unto true life and in many hearts faith will arise and many eyes will be opened to the light but anyway let's jump over to the next verse that we'll look at it's also in chapter 53 It's down here in verse 39 but let me start in verse 38 it says over the war for material domination my justice will rule and later over the new battle to achieve the imposition of certain doctrines and religions my truth shall be imposed so that's also talking about this judgment that we'll get from Elijah but you look there in verse 39 it says the one single truth shall flash like lightning in the night of the storm and each one wherever he might be shall behold that splendor so here it is the great awakening is being described like a flash of light in the night verse 40 says my message will come to all and all will come to me it's described down here in verse 31 through 34 as well let me read this it says my doctrine my name shall be the target of all sorts of attacks and persecutions it shall be the motive of your persecution by the enemies of truth so this right here is that war on those who keep the commandments. These false and these hypocrites are the enemies of truth that's being talked about here. And so these guys will persecute us that keep the commandments. It says, yet my doctrine shall be the sword of light of those who rise up defending the faith. And it shall be the shield behind which the innocent are defended. OK, and we so we need to remember that, that we have to stand up and defend the faith when all of this is going on. This kind of points to what we hear about, about we have to be sure not to deny his name 
It says, my name shall be on all lips, blessed by some and cursed by others. So those false and those hypocrites, after we have this awakening moment, will start to curse his name. But look there at verse 32. Verse 33 says, how much confusion there shall be then, how many there shall be who having believed that they had faith in me will be convinced that it was not true faith. See, this is what's actually going to cause the apostasy. That's what apostasy is, is when people start to deny their faith. So you have all of these people who thought things were supposed to go one way. But when it turns out it doesn't go the way that they were taught by the false prophets, then they will actually start to deny that faith. They're actually going to be convinced that that what they had was not a true faith at all. And they're going to denounce it. You see down here in verse 41, it says the spiritual valley shall come closer to men. This is the great awakening that we're talking about. But notice down here in verse 42, it says the religions shall sow fear in those who believe these messages. So our religious leaders will actually become our enemies at that time as they try to convince us that what we are experiencing is coming from a different source maybe a vaccine maybe aliens or maybe 5g technology or maybe we are just gone crazy or something like that that's what the religious leaders and the scientists would be trying to convince us of but notice down here in verse 43 it says those who haven't been deprived of hope by science shall recover their health spiritually in other words, this is going to be a miraculous healing of the Father's people that will take place during that time. We saw that mentioned over in Malachi in chapter 4 and verse 2, where it says, Unto those who fear his name, the Son of Righteousness will arise with healing in his wings. And it does say, S-U-N, Son of Righteousness. But by now, we know that the rays of the sun does have healing properties. Maybe those healing properties will be amplified during this time as well. I'm not sure how it's going to happen, but because the scripture says so, I know for a fact it is going to happen. All right, the next thing that I want to show you is a short video created by that channel called The Bible Project. The video is called The Temple, and it is an excellent illustration of what's actually about to happen to us in this great awakening and even why is going to take place. If you could go back to the city of Jerusalem during Bible times, the biggest thing you'd see is the temple. This beautiful building was designed by King David and built by King Solomon, and they believed that it was the home of the God of the universe. Wait, I thought God's home was in heaven. Well, the whole point of this earthly temple is that it's the place that overlaps with God's heavenly home. The temple is where God lives and rules all creation as king. That's cool, but even Solomon, who built the temple, didn't believe that it could contain the God of the universe, right? Yeah, the building was just a symbol, and it pointed to the fact that all of creation is God's temple. And that's actually what the first page of the Bible, Genesis 1, is all about. Really? It says that creation is God's temple? Well, it doesn't need to say it. The whole story shows it. In Genesis 1, God creates an ordered world out of a dark wasteland by speaking in a series of seven days. Then on the seventh day, God's presence fills creation as he takes up his rest and rule. Similarly, the tabernacle and later the temple were built and dedicated in a series of seven speeches and seven days, after which the priest or king could rest and rule in God's presence. Ah, so all of creation is where God intends to dwell. It's like his temple. Exactly. Now, turn the page to Genesis 2 and we get another portrait of creation. This one focuses in on the land. And in the center of the land is a region called Eden, which in Hebrew means delight. And in the middle of delight, God plants a garden in which God and humanity live together. And that's why the temple was modeled after the garden, filled with imagery of gold and flowers. The menorah symbolized the tree of life. It's the place where God dwells with his people. Oh, got it. And check this out. 
in the temple, the Israelite priests and Levites were to work and to keep the temple in God's presence. This is exactly the job description given to humanity in the Garden of Eden. So these humans were the first priests. But instead of ruling with God, they wanted to rule on their own terms, and they're exiled from the Garden Temple. And like Adam and Eve, Israel's leaders also wanted to rule on their own terms, and they too were exiled. The temple was destroyed, and this left them wondering, did God give up on Israel? Will God bring about a new creation? Well, the biblical prophets anticipated the day when God would create a new temple with a new priesthood. That's when God's presence would fill all of creation. And when the Israelites returned to the land, they did rebuild the temple. But that temple didn't turn out the way the prophets hoped. In fact, later Israelite prophets said that this temple was hopelessly corrupt. So they're still waiting for the ultimate temple. And here we come to the story of Jesus. He said that through him, God's presence and rule was coming into our world in a new way. And he presented himself as a new kind of priest. But Jesus wasn't a priest, and he didn't work in the temple. Right. Jesus said that God's presence, his rest and rule, was filling the world through his own life, death, and resurrection. Jesus was claiming that he was the true temple. And this new temple would expand out to include all of creation. That's a really big claim. And it got even bigger. After his resurrection, Jesus said that God's presence would come to dwell in and among his followers so that they would become mini temples. Communities of people where God rests and rules. Exactly. This is the Bible's vision of the church, which is described as a temple. Not a building, but people. Yeah, like when Peter says, you all are living stones built up as a temple for God's spirit to dwell. So at the end of the story, do we ever get a new physical temple? Well, not exactly. What we see is a renewed cosmic temple, just like Genesis 1. And this new creation doesn't need a temple building because through Jesus, all creation is now the place where God rests and rules the world with his people.